Welcome, welcome, welcome. Ah, I'm so glad you guys are here. Welcome to the Emblex Review class. And today uh, we are talking about ethics and laws and regulations. Uh, we're talking about some guidelines to a professional practice. Yes, yes, this, and we're talking about this because these categories represent about 30% of the questions on your test. For those of you who have taken the MBLEX before, there are many of you, by the way, who have tried and not succeeded in taking this test. And uh, but about 31 questions on your test uh, are gonna be about guidelines to a professional practice, ethics, laws and regulations, and, and you may wonder, my goodness, Jody, what in the heck does that have to do with, um, with, um, with, our, with practicing massage therapy? Well, what it has to do is protecting public safety. And so that's why we need to know these things about business and about, um, about ethics and, um, and it really helps our entire profession, the entire profession of massage therapy uh, to be stronger when we operate uh, in an ethical manner. And so that's why we're gonna talk about them. So today we're gonna start off with the importance of a positive mindset. I wanna just give you part one and uh, let's, yeah, just gonna give you part one uh, with this professional mindset. And then uh, we're gonna move into our learning tip for today because it's, it's pretty big. Uh, and the final part, that's part two. And then part three of our class is dissecting questions. Yes. Uh, and so we have some yummy questions today. Um, but what I wanna start off with is, I mentioned that, you know, that students and well, graduates of massage school join this class all the time, join our patron posse uh, after lots of students have already tried and not succeeded in taking this test. Um, and we have a philosophy, I have a philosophy and I'd like to offer that philosophy to you. And that is the philosophy of failing forward. Failing forward. Yeah. Now, for those of you who are watching for the first time, I just remembered I didn't introduce myself. Hi, I'm Jody Skulls. I'm your instructor uh, for the MBLEX review course. And my philosophy is that you cannot fail. You cannot fail. I know it's very like positive mental attitude, Pollyanna. Oh, she's always so up. You know what? Yeah. Because I believe in you. I believe for my own self as well, that although the path is bumpy, the path is perfect. Really, the path is gonna be bumpy. You know, we expect to go from like uh, point A right here, straight line, boom, right, boom, boom point you know, to, to point B. Uh, and it never goes in a straight line. It doesn't. It never goes in a straight line. <laughs> it's always like point A to point B, right? But we want to go this way and it's like. Now, so permission, permission to fail, permission to fail forward. That failing forward is a really important part of your journey. Now you're going to see me go off camera for a second because I want to turn off that uh, hang on. All right, I'm back. I just don't like a fan in the, in the um, like whipping. It's very distracting. So know that you have permission to fail forward. That if you have failed the Mblex, no big deal. Yeah, it costs some money. That's all right. You know, so in massage school, you're here now. That's what counts. You're here right now, getting your mind, your body, your mind set ready, 
ready to be a massage therapist, ready to be a licensed massage therapist. Boom, high five, yes. Imagine, and that's what we'll do in this time together as we talk about our practice. We're gonna be talking about an ethical practice, um, a professional practice, what that looks like. And you know, you got this in massage school, you got some of it, but I, I guarantee you there's gonna be something in here today uh, that you didn't get in massage school. So, um, and let's move in that general direction. So know that a very important part of the success of, of passing the emblex is a positive mindset. It may not come naturally to you, that's okay. It's okay. You got me, I am your cheerleader. I will remind you all the time that you are perfect. You are perfect. You may not feel perfect and that's okay. That doesn't mean you're not, you're still perfect. Yeah, you can't get this wrong. You can't fail for real. This is the perfect time. We're only going to be able to see this in hindsight. It may not look perfect right now, but that's okay. It is. And you are. You are. You are called to be a massage therapist. You're my people. I know you. Yeah, we're not, not everybody's like this. Not everybody sees like gnarly feet and goes, ooh, bring them to me. <laughs> right? Not everybody puts their hand on someone's shoulder and goes, ooh, that's tight. It's a gift. And so that gift is unfolding for you at the perfect time and in the perfect way. I see you. I know how you serve. Mm -hmm. I know. We'll get there. All right. Part of the way we're going to get there is we're going to do some learning. <laughs> so here we go. All right, let's get to our welcome. Oh, I got to share the screen. Hello, Joan. Share the screen. There we go. All right. Welcome back. Welcome back to the MBLEX review course. Uh, and today we're talking about ethics, boundaries, laws, regulations, guidelines to a professional practice. You already know that there's about 30 to 31 questions on your emblex on this on these categories. Now, as you let me put us up here. Okay, there we go. Um, so as you we go through this material, you may say, Oh, I don't remember learning this in massage school. That's okay. You they may have covered it quickly, or you may have had no point of reference. So that's why we're reviewing the material. So here's what we're gonna to cover today. I'm gonna to go through a ton of definitions. Uh, we're gonna talk about the NCB TMB. If you haven't heard of that, we'll talk about that. Laws, regulations. Some of the words we're gonna be de digging down on is the ethical parts of dual relationships and then looking more in depth at boundary crossings and boundary violations, all right? Okay, here we go with some definitions and they all sound alike. Okay, so ethics technically is the study of moral behavior, okay? It's a, a set of principles, it's the study. So ethics itself is the study of moral behavior and like what those ethics, our body of work, the stuff that we believe in guides us in out what we feel is is the best action to take and what might not be the best action to take so technically ethics is a is a set of moral principles that we live by or we try and live by so it's a system it's like it's the study of or the system of our morals According to the dictionary, it's a set of moral principles. And you'll see if you want to sometime just, you can type in a word and put definition behind it. So ethics and definition. Um, and so it's, it's the principles, the moral principles that give us our code of conduct. 
It's how we stay true. It's how we stay in integrity. If something feels a little off, it may be because it's not in alignment with your moral principles. The NCBTMB is called the National Certification Board. That's the first three letters. National Certification Board, Therapeutic Massage and Body Work. Terrible name, I know. But the NCBTMB offers a higher certification. So you pass the MLEX <clears throat> and then you practice, you know, for say four to six months, you qualify after doing, oh, I forget, 200 hours. I'll look that up and let you know. Uh, but you have to perform a certain number of hours of massage therapy before you're eligible to be a member of the NCB TMB. And they say very specifically in their code of ethics that massage therapists shall act in a manner that justifies the public trust. You enhance the reputation of our profession and you safeguard the interest of individual clients. All right, have you seen that before? <laughs> All right, let's move on. Values, you might hear, and these are words that in your emblex, they'll feel like they, they all squish together. You're gonna need to be careful with these business questions. We're really going to need to understand what the question is asking. And so values are um, principles and beliefs that influence behavior uh, of a group, of a community. Um, and so just ask yourself, what are some of your own values? Where did those come from? And values can differ from country to country, from person to person, but certainly country to country, right? There are certain countries who really have been proactive about climate change. There are certain states that have been really proactive about climate change. That, that's a demonstration of values. It's principles and beliefs that influence how we act, how, our behavior. And specifically the values represent a group, a community. Morals, now this is where it's like, okay, where did your morals come from, right? Um, so this is a personal thing, my personal morals, it can be acceptable by a group. You may have gotten them from your country, from your parents, from your spiritual home. You know, uh, some people will call that their religion, um, but morals are a person's standards of behavior. So for example, in India, uh, is they believe that the cow is a sacred animal and therefore they don't eat meat. They don't eat red meat. They believe animals are sacred. And that's a, that's a moral principle for them. So this is our thoughts on what's right and wrong. So they think it's wrong to eat meat. That's for them, right? When people from India visit the U.S. or they come to live in the U.S. or when Americans come, you know, go and visit India, you know, they don't look down on Americans because that's that's not how Americans, that's not their value system, right? Um, it's not how their morals are driving their behavior. See how those words kind of interchange and get a little messy? Yeah. So just know it gets messy and we'll do the best we can. This would be a good time if you get a question like this to use the tool in your toolbox which is to eliminate two wrong answers, right? Yeah, get rid of two answers you know aren't right if you get a sticky question like this. Let's move away from the intangible to the tangible uh, and wanted to review with you informed consent, the definition of informed consent. It's also sometimes called informed written consent, written consent, informed voluntary consent. These are all legitimate uh, names for informed consent. And this is the process that's used by the massage therapist to get the client's permission to touch an area of the body that could be iffy. And this will surprise you, right? The iffy parts. Um, and I hope you can see this whole thing. 
Uh, but these areas of the body that we need informed consent for are places like the abdomen. If you're going to touch someone's belly, you know how to drape, right? If you have to touch someone's belly, how many of you guys have done abdominal work before? Um, just put um, put me in the chat if you've done abdominal work, um, if you're not driving or operating heavy machinery. <laughs> So yeah, if you if you practiced abdominal work in school, we need to have informed consent when it comes to that. Let's see. Oh, good, good, good. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Yep. Hey, if you, you know what? The best way, if you it's been a while since you have done abdominal work, go get some. <laughs> And make sure they drape you appropriately. You will be draped across the chest. So with a towel, touch a towel because I have a towel right behind me, uh, but a draped with a towel. So it's like this. And you can actually move that client's arm over. So you can tuck it under the arm or you can tuck it over the arm and secure it under the arm. But I want it secure. Key to draping, secure. So uh, if you are getting informed consent, you'll be getting that for abdominal. Um, if you're gonna work in the clavicle and the pectoralis region, the pectoral region, some people's safe, safe zones are wider than others. Get permission, let them know you're going there. We can get written consent or we can get verbal consent. Depends where you're going, right? Yeah. Um, but we get um, informed consent because it might surprise the client. How many of you have had a client that was surprised by getting glute work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Someone, it, it, have, you got, have you done glute work? And then you know, ooh, they go like that. Well, turns out we need to ask permission. That's happened to me. Yeah, so it might be surprising. It might be unusual. Maybe they've never had their feet touched before. Maybe they've never had their face worked before. Yeah, or there may be a sexual history. So the only time they get touched in that area is maybe during sex. And so this sensual experience is reminding them of something sexual. So the ears, for example. Yeah, so you'll see here, these areas are could be the, the abs, pecs, glutes, groin, doing groin work, secure drape, secure drape. The inguinal region, the ears, um, sometimes the face or the feet can also be an area where, you know, if somebody's ticklish, let's, let's get their permission. Great, great question to ask at the beginning of the session. Is there any place you know you don't like touch? Yeah, don't touch my feet. What? Don't touch your feet. I Okay, don't touch my head, don't touch my hair. We're getting informed consent and it is a part of our ethics. It's a part of our being a professional to ask these kind of questions. This uh, also pertains to the scope of practice, another definition, right? This is when we understand the limits of our work. So, um, so we are not, a licensed nutritionist, unless you are. We are not a licensed clinical social worker. That's what LCSW stands for. Licensed clinical social worker, a therapist. We are not therapists, right? And well, we're massage therapists. And sometimes people talk on our table a lot, um, but we are not there to do therapy. Understand the scope of your practice. Um, and if your client is ready to see uh, another medical professional. I mean, recently I, I, I referred out uh, to a talk therapist, a psychotherapist, and also to a personal trainer. I was able to, to uh, make two different referrals because they were ready. My clients were asking me about exercise. And I'm like, unless I'm in the gym with you, no. So have a great personal trainer. 
have a really good therapist that you trust in your Rolodex, in your phone uh, to, to refer to. Because when it's out of the scope of our practice, we, we are crossing boundaries. The standards of practice are different than the scope of practice. And you'll see both terms. The standards of practice means what is your standard? That what is competent now? Here's the irony. This test is so ridiculous that it's testing you way beyond your competency. Just saying. But the standard of practice, and we're going to talk about a few categories that are in these standards and what those standards are. So it's an expected level, um, your degree of excellence. Um, and these are clearly defined uh, for massage therapists, oddly enough. One of the standards is your professionalism. Now, understand that the word professionalism has many different meanings. The word, the word can be made. We can be talking about you as a professional, right? As a person. And these questions are on the practice exam. There's a lot of tricky questions around professionalism, being a professional. Um, what is your profession? So I'm going to give you those three, right? Professionalism. That is what we expect. That's the that's what we that's a noun. Being a professional is also a noun, but that's you as an individual. You're a professional. And then what do you practice? What is your profession? You're a massage therapist. So this we look at and having a standard of professionalism. What is your standard? Um, so demonstrate excellence um, through your touch. Demonstrate excellence. Here it says through responsible, compassionate, and respectful touch. Yes. Also, what are you going to wear? Have you decided what you're going to wear? When I practice massage therapy, I happen to wear all black. Just easier. When I had a, a large clinic uh, in uh, Northern Virginia, we all wore staff shirts. We all wore uniforms. Um, and they, I touched my chest because it had the, um, the emblem on it, uh, an embroidered name of the company on it, Northern Virginia Massage Center. Uh, some people want to wear scrubs. Great. That's fine. Be intentional. You know, the, whoosh, the whole, no spaghetti straps. That was just my, uh, that was my personal uh, code of conduct for my staff. Why would I care about spaghetti straps versus short sleeves? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Yeah, thank you for these comments. Yeah. Um, why no spaghetti straps? I'll leave that for you to think about. But take a look at how these uh, individuals are, um, are dressed. One's in scrubs, one's in a staff shirt. Uh, here we're working, what are we working? Oh, the world championships, the world um, championships of, uh, it's actually a picture of me, uh, of, um, for the police and firemen. Yeah, we're working an event. So we had t-shirts. If you're working an event, you may want to consider t-shirts even. But that is a nod to your professionalism, right? You look like a professional. Be careful of the length, the, the, the dips in the shirt, the slits in the skirt, the length of the shorts length of the shorts when you're standing be below your fingertips. All right. That's not on the emblem. That's just uh, that's just for your benefit. <laughs> All right. Another category that we need to look at is the legal and ethical requirements for your standard of practice. That just means we look at these and you got to comply with all of the legal regulations, right? So getting your business license, whether it's in your town, your city, your county, your state and passing the emblex. All of those are your responsibilities. And here we see a picture of uh, the United States. There are still some states that don't have licensing for massage therapists. Um, Minnesota is getting there. It's taking a long time. Wyoming is getting there. Um, 
Kansas actually has now passed that law. I thought I read that. Sorry, I'll, I'll double check that for you. There's only a handful of states. Vermont definitely has no licensure. California is questioning the MBLEX right now. Uh, and then New York and, uh, well, California is questioning the MBLEX, is, is challenging it. So is Arizona. So if you leave in, live in either of those two states and you have graduated from massage school, make a phone call. See if you can apply for your license. Yes, something that, uh, and now in Hawaii and New York, uh, they both have their own test. And coming soon, coming soon, there's something, it'll be this summer. So uh, the summer of 2023, they will be launching something called the Compact. The Compact is 10 plus states. At last count, I think we were at 13 and they were shooting for 18 states that are going to agree on reciprocity, meaning that your massage therapy license in Virginia will be good in the neighboring states, in these 10, 15, 18 other states. So if you move from uh, Virginia, who's a part of the compact, into another state that's part of the compact, you're automatically licensed. Yeah. So uh, that is up and coming. Very exciting. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I know. I'm really excited about that. Yeah. Of course, it's going to be more money. It's going to be like another $200. But that's all right. It's going to begin to allow our massage therapy licenses to be portable. And that's the good news. All right, another standard of your practice is called confidentiality. Uh, you have to keep your uh, client records confidential. Now, if you are a home-based practice, that just means out of sight. That means they're not laying around, they're organized. You know how to get back to your health intake sheets. You use a health intake sheet. Yes, you use a health intake sheet. I know it takes more time. It's worth it. However, you have to keep those health intake sheets confidential. Uh, and so if you're a home-based practice or a sole proprietor with no other people in your office, uh, then you can keep them in, an, um, in a secure place, but not locked. If you are in a professional setting, you do need to keep those locked. Yeah. And also, if you decide to go with electronic health records, those have to be encrypted. Uh, and so there are, there's a lovely service out there. I'll stick this in the chat. Her name is Diana Thompson. She has written several books on massage therapy. Um, she has a EHR, if you'd like to go in that direction or recommend it to wherever you're gonna work. Uh, it's EHR, Healing Hands EHR. EHR stands for Electronic Health Records. And those do need to be encrypted. Uh, so that people can't hack into your computer. Yeah, and these laws um, reflect HIPAA laws. HIPAA laws don't apply technically to massage therapists unless we're working with another licensed healthcare professional or unless the laws are different in your city, town, county, state. <laughs> yeah. So I like to abide by HIPAA laws. Uh, HIPAA is the Health Insurance Portability and Protection Act. So uh, I guess I said that right. Anyhow, we'll see in a minute. There we have a slide on that. All right, oh, there we go. <laughs> the next act. Oh, I did there right. Yay. Um, so uh, can massage therapists share client information? No, you cannot. Um, not unless your client has signed a medical release form. Remember that from school, the medical release form? Yes. And so there are standard copies online. I'm happy to give you a, a, a standard copy. If perchance um, you know that that client is being seen by other healthcare professionals, you can ask, you know, would you like me to share any of your, your treatment notes? Uh, and sometimes they do, especially if they're in PT. Uh, so in 1996, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act uh, put that into 
uh, made that a law, and that does apply to massage therapists. Not all of the confidential records keeping applies to um, massage therapists. Again, only if you're in an office with a chiropractor, a physical therapist, uh, a registered nurse, a nurse practitioner, um, if you're in a traditional medical setting then we do need to keep those records secure. Uh, but what does apply to us 100% of the time is the medical release form. So that refers to our best business practices. And that's another category that we need to be aware of are what are our best business practices when it comes to the standard of our practice. So you've got a safe space that you're seeing clients. You've got your liability insurance, you're keeping notes. Um, your clients understand what's going to be, uh, what's going to be your pricing. Do you notice there's a puppy on the screen? Yes, there's a puppy on the screen because this material is boring. But puppies are not. Look at that cute puppy. Hello, puppy. And kitties are great too, right? <laughs> Best business practices. Let's bring it back in. Um, so you've got, you know how your clients are going to be paying you. I mean, I just ran into that situation. Uh, I, uh, I, in the past, uh, traded an hour for an hour, bartered uh, with a tennis professional. I got a tennis lesson and he got a massage. We'll talk about bartering in a minute. We had a clear arrangement. Well, the tennis professional left and then came back into town and wanted a massage. Well, in the past, we had bartered. What was going to be happening now? And I, the client left. The tennis professional left and didn't pay. It was up to, I was like, okay, well, he, I was like, oh, well, he, you know, well, he reached out to me and say, hey, I need to pay you. Mm -mm, sure didn't. I had to reach out to him. We'll send a little Venmo request, send a little PayPal request. I actually sent a Venmo request. Have clear financial arrangements in advance. That was my bad, right? Felt a little uncomfortable, a little awkward. Uh, so moving forward in your business practice, follow um, best practices as far as having a bookkeeper or an accountant. Make sure you keep your books. It says here, acceptable accounting principles. That means keep your books accurately. No fakey fakey. Um, pay your taxes so that you can pay your taxes. Uh, and look, you wanna be making enough money to, to pay taxes. That's a good thing. Really? I make a quarterly tax deposit. Yeah. You wanna be making money. So when you're an employee, and this will be a nice pause here, we have two different ways that you can work um, as a massage therapist. One, if you are a sole proprietor, you are an individual, you're an LLC, you're a sole proprietor, you're working for yourself. Well, as your clients pay you, that usually goes into your bank account or it goes into savings or whatever. But that's, your clients are paying you, there's no, not somebody else handing you a paycheck, right? And so we still owe taxes. If you earn over $600, you owe taxes on that money. And so, I know in 2023 that you are gonna earn more than $600 on doing massage. I know you are, yes. Uh, and so we'll need to declare that as income. That's following ex uh, best practices as far as your accounting, you know, as far as your bookkeeping. Now, the other way is that you go to work for someone. Now, when you go to work for someone else, you're gonna get a paycheck, that paycheck, will either be given to you with the taxes taken out or with the taxes left in. So with the taxes taken out, you're an employee. If the taxes have been left in, you're an independent contractor. Do those terms sound familiar to you? Independent contractor and uh, employee? Yeah, so the difference is taxes taken out, taxes left in. And many massage therapists are like, I like it better. I like it better when no one takes out my money. And guess what? You're about to not like it better. Here's why. At the end of the year, your employer will give you a document. They give you a copy of the document and they send a copy to the federal government. 
saying, I have paid Mary $10,000. Wouldn't that be great? I've paid Mary $10,000 in 2023. So the federal government gets a copy of that. Now, if Mary, if you didn't have any of your taxes taken out, you owe taxes on that money. Uh-oh. But if you're an employee, if Mary, if you're an employee and they send that note to the federal government saying, hey, we paid Mary $10,000 and we paid you taxes. We took her taxes out. That means you're getting a tax return. You get almost all that money back, depending on your you know, marital status and how many kids you have and you know, how much other money you've made and where you made your money. There's a lot of different things in there, but that's why being a W-2 employee. So the piece of paper that you get as an independent contractor is called a 1099. That's a tax bill. Kind of, because it says how much you've made and how much you owe money on. As an employee, you get a W-2. They've taken the taxes out for you. No problem. You know who else likes employees, likes W-2 employees? The bank. Mm-hmm. You want to buy a house one day? Get a paycheck. Get a W-2. All right. I'm going to leave it at that. I see a couple of comments coming in. Let's see what those are. Yeah, happy to explain. Yes, you can work in an, in an office uh, for a chiropractor. Kiara is saying that she works as an independent contractor. That's great. Um, consider maybe um, seeing if they would be willing to take you on as an employee. I find it to be a better financial arrangement for you. That's just my personal opinion. It's really, it's up to you. All right. And so when you keep your tax receipts, um, right here it says for the last four years, but it's actually best practices to keep them for the last seven years as far as your federal stuff. All right, let's move along. Ooh, goodness gracious, how did I get to be so late? All right, we're gonna talk about roles and boundaries and a few more, and then we're gonna go and dissect some questions. Roles and boundaries are also a part of a standard of practice, something that we're, it's a standard that I'm going to hold you to that as a massage professional, you are being held to. So the NCB TMB says that, that we need to adhere to all of the ethical boundaries, um, to be a professional, to safeguard the therapeutic relationship. We're gonna talk about a few terms and then we're gonna talk about boundaries. Part of what we face as massage therapists is transference. And that is when a client is feeling a certain way about the therapist. So the client is actually feeling a certain way. A lot of times it's based on childhood experiences or maybe you remind them of someone, but they're transferring a feeling to you that doesn't really belong to you, but that's transference. And look, it's a legitimate thing. It's not just like, they have an opinion or like that they can control it. This is a legitimate biological reaction. And, that, and a lot of times based on the childhood experience, maybe something they don't even remember. But that's called transference. And it's a part of maintaining our role as a therapeutic professional, as a licensed um, healthcare professional. Yeah, about being a professional. Now, counter transference is when we as therapists transfer a feeling onto a client, maybe because it, yeah, they remind you of someone or there's unresolved feelings about something else uh, and we unconsciously are transferring. Uh, but that is called counter transference. So counter comes from us. Yeah, <laughs> and in the example, I use this image with this guy kind of punching on his cell phone. It's like, if, if you feel this way, <laughs> uh, when you see a client has scheduled, <laughs> then you know, there might be some counter transference going on. Mm -hmm. All right, part of the standard that you are also held to is the prevention of sexual misconduct. And that is to, if that's in any way sexualizing the therapeutic relationship. So, Massage therapists recognize the intimacy of this therapeutic relationship. And 
the vulnerability of the client. Let's take a look, David, just a little deeper. Um, well, it's strictly prohibited, obviously. Uh, well, I guess it's not obvious. It's strictly prohibited for massage therapists uh, to sexualize the therapeutic relationship. Uh, there is an exception to that rule, and that is if you have had sex with the person already before they became a client. Best practices is if you would like to explore a more intimate relationship with this person who is a client, they can no longer be a client. AMTA says you need to wait six months. If you met that person and you have given them a massage and all of a sudden, you know, Cupid's arrow hits and you're like, oh, I think I like them. Technically, according to the MBLEX, you're supposed to wait six months before you date them. Even if you stop seeing them as a client. I know, crazy. But that's I'm just telling you what the AMTA says, right? What I am telling you, though, is best practices is do not compromise yourself or the therapeutic relationship by sexualizing a session. It takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to earn it, according to Mr. Warren Buffett. Think about that, you might act differently. Roles and boundaries, part of that is, you know, not doing massage, actually <laughs> for you not to have alcohol or any illegal drugs, um, for you not to be doing massage under the influence. Uh, and likewise, massage therapists have the right if you think someone is under the influence, whether it's alcohol, drugs, um, or even prescribed medication, if you feel as though that's gonna compromise uh, the session, you have every right to not do that session. We need our clients to be receiving the work therapeutically. Oh, dual relationships. This is an important one. This is one that comes up often on the MPLEX. Uh, dual relationships are three kinds, and here are these three bullet points. So dual relationships is just like what it sounds. There's more than one relationship. So it's any relationship you have with a person outside of the treatment room. So that could be social. You know, maybe you met this person through a social setting. It could be familial. Maybe they're your parent or your sister or your aunt um, or a business relationship. Uh, maybe um, you're a dry cleaner. You know, maybe you buy goods and services from them. So there are different types of dual relationships. Uh, anything outside the therapeutic relationship, sometimes those dual relationships are also called multidimensional. You'll see that word down here, multidimensional. And maybe you're doing a 5K and you run into a client. You're at the grocery store. You're at the gym. Best practices says you do not acknowledge them unless you knew them before, unless you know them in another way, right? If it's your sister, you can acknowledge her. Um, if it's your pastor, if it's, you know, if you have another relationship outside, but if the only relationship you have with them is the therapeutic relationship, best practices is not to initiate the greeting. Not everybody tells their friends or their family that they get massage. Yeah. So don't initiate the greeting. Let them come to you or let them walk by. Don't take it personally. They're just a private person. So quick look at five categories um, of guidelines, intimacy. We know that uh, sometimes that closeness can be mistaken for affection. It is your moral obligation to keep the therapeutic relationship therapeutic. Comes down to handshake or a hug, right? When they leave, are they giving you a hug? Have they hugged you before? Gray, best practices is handshake. Emblex question, no hugs. In your personal practice, figure it out. <laughs> I have so many stories about this. I'm gonna tell you one. I had a guy start coming, an awesome guy, Jim, real name. 
80, 78 years old, okay? As he leaves, he gets his first massage ever, okay, at 78 years old. As he leaves, he leans in, I think he's gonna hug me. He kisses me on the mouth. Ah! Oh, he's 78. I mean, so anyhow, I spent like a month, well, like three months dodging, right? Finally, I say to him, Jim, this is gonna be best. I, we can, I can do a hug, but this isn't comfortable for me. He goes, oh, it's fine. <laughs> it's no big deal to him, you know? He had spent a lot of time in Europe. I mean, it was like, ooh, but it was really uncomfortable for me. Ooh, okay. But that's because we keep our boundaries clear. All right, next category. Uh, don't borrow or lend money. Best practices, don't borrow, don't lend money from, from a client. Changes the relationship. Again, this is the proper answer for the MBLEX. Also, you know, use your best judgment about any stock market deals that you hear from the massage table. That could be insider trading. That could be, you know, you're working on the CEO of a company that's about to go public and you buy a bunch of stock. Sketchy. Also, I mentioned bartering earlier. Um, if you will, if you decide to barter anything, uh, barter hour for hour, not dollar for dollar. Bartering is the exchange of, uh, of services for something other than money. But in our practice, because it is an hour, we can't, like we spend an hour with people. This is the only way bartering works with a massage therapist. I'm telling you, I've tried it. It, it, it ends up creating resentments if you do it any other way. The only way I have found it works is if you trade hour for hour. I have a lawyer. They wanted to barter. His hourly rate is $250. Every time I made a phone call, he got two and a half hours of massage. Not good. Guess who got resentful? Yeah. So hour for hour or don't do it. I mean, I know some massage therapists, well, I want all my vegetables and I just give them an hour massage. How do we know what's equity, right? How do we know how much are those vegetables worth? How much do you charge? I mean, if you're hungry, you're hungry. Get some vegetables, you know, go get some food, barter. But just know <clears throat> that the best practices for your personal practice is hour for hour. All right, just a couple more categories and then we'll move into dissecting questions. We're holding you to a professional standard when it comes to emotional dependency or needs uh, of your clients. Some clients are very needy um, and we need to have very good boundaries, physical boundaries, emotional boundaries about your feelings, right? Your physical boundaries is like your personal space. Um, there are other types of boundaries, your time. Do they always show up late? Are you always going over? Have clear boundaries. There are sexual boundaries, you know, just about your body. You know, this is not with clients, obviously, but these are types of boundaries. Intellectual boundaries, uh, that is your thoughts. Um, we don't really bring our opinions into the treatment room personally. However, do you make space for other people's thoughts? You don't have to believe them. You just make space for them. And material boundaries, your things. That relates to do people treat your things with care, with respect. All right. Last two categories. Um, the professional standard, unintentional, unplanned uh, relationships, unplanned encounters. Uh, our first role is as a massage therapist. We've mentioned that if you see someone at the coffee shop, you see someone at the gym, let them initiate the contact. If it's unintentional or unplanned, they may be taken off guard. And then finally, the standard, um, the final standard, we they call it altruism, which basically means just putting others first, but really it's the practice of being concerned for the well-being of others. And we do expect as massage therapists that you are going to care about the well-being of others. Hopefully that's 
at least part of what motivated you to become a massage therapist. And some questions you can ask uh, if you're wondering whether or not this is a dual relationship or a, a proper approach. Um, is there a power differential? You know, how will this secondary relationship be affected by that power differential? You know, think about a school teacher and the student. We're kind of, it's the same power differential. How long will this relationship last? Is it a one-time occurrence or is it expected to last indefinitely? Um, we may need to address that secondary relationship, that multi-dimensional, that dual relationship. Um, anyhow, so these are some other, other questions you can ask. How, how much will your objectivity be impaired if you have a dual relationship, another relationship? Um, it, it's, it, I live in a neighborhood uh, that has a pool. I have clients in my neighborhood. I have to be very conscientious about if I go to the pool in a bathing suit. Of course, you're gonna to go to the pool in a bathing suit, but I have to be conscientious about whether or not clients are there. Changes how they see me, right? Yeah, and that would be a dual relationship. Ooh, all right, final topic, boundary crossing. It's, it's an, I don't know if you can see this, let's see. All right, it is, a boundary crossing would be unintentional, usually. Um, it creates a secondary relationship, um, but one that's not harmful, one that's not going to um, blur the objectivity of your role. Okay, that's a boundary crossing. It's not harmful, it's not exploitive, exploitive it's not coercive, it's, you know, it's a oopsie but you can keep it professional. Like, oh, I ran into that person at Home Depot, you know? And so just that's a boundary crossing, but a boundary violation, that would be sexualizing the massage. You deviate from your therapeutic role. So, Pardon the the slide is is worded incorrectly here, but right at the end you'll see the boundary violation. It's harmful, or potentially harmful. Yeah, to the patient or to the therapeutic relationship. That's a boundary violation. So we're here. See here a few um, examples. I'm going to move this back over here. Okay. All right. So I'll give you a few examples here. Church. You see somebody at church, that's a client. They are a client first, and then you see them at church. Boundary crossing, boundary violation. I will tell you, it is a boundary crossing. Okay, so let's address this uh, question here that's just come up from Melissa. There was a kickback, uh, something I haven't heard of before. Instead of bartering on the practice exam, I said, well, a kickback, is unexpected upward motion of the guide bar on a chin. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it is. <laughs> a kickback is, yeah, and that's actually what it's gonna do to you. If you get a kickback for referring a client, so a kickback is a term that's used if you refer to a chiropractor and then they kick you back some money. You refer to a trainer, they kick you back some money. Not allowed, unethical. So seeing somebody at church though, simply a boundary crossing. You can keep it professional. It's not harmful to them. Going out to dinner with a client. Boundary crossing, boundary violation. Boundary violation. Can't do it. And look, at this table, they have wine. Yeah, no, can't do it. Compromises the therapeutic relationship. I'm sorry. If you see a client at a birthday party, different than going out one-on-one. -on -one. Boundary violation to have a dinner date with your client, same sex or opposite sex, because it changes the therapeutic relationship. Texting from your personal phone, boundary crossing, boundary violation. It's actually a boundary crossing. It's not a violation, except for look at what this picture says. I have been thinking of you every second since you left. Boundary violation, inappropriate, 
sexualizing the therapy session, boundary violation. Many of us operate our businesses from our personal phone. And so that's, uh, that is often how we connect with clients. Just be very careful of what uh, you text. I have a personal preference that if I'm setting up uh, appointments with a husband and a wife, I communicate mostly with the wife. Just a good habit. All right, good job. I know that was a lot of information and we've stretched our session. Uh, let's go through a few quick questions in the part three. If you gotta jump off, jump off. Love you, appreciate you. Uh, we're gonna go through these questions very quickly. You can slow them down, go back over the recording because these are ethical questions. A dual relationship. Dual relationships are when blank. When a client becomes a friend, but just to have dinner or a happy hour. When a client asks you to help them move. When you know a client before they become a client, such as from church or a family member. A client with a personality disorder. All right, this is such a crazy question. And I just want to let you know that the emblex is going to be confusing at times. Breathe. What you see here in letter A, when a client becomes a friend, well, that would be a dual relationship, right? But that's not the best answer. When a client asks you to help them move, ooh, if you did, then that would be a dual relationship, wouldn't it? But that's not the best answer. Queen of Hearts, Queen of Hearts nails it. Boom. A dual, relation, dual relationships are when you know a client before they become a client, such as from church or a family member. That is a classic dual relationship. If you see them outside and create a dual relationship, that's different. But technically, it's when you know them before. And then they come in and they are a client. Likewise, if they are a client and then you see them outside. Technically, A but this is more a boundary violation. Excuse me, a boundary, yeah, boundary violation. All right, let's get through these questions. If a client offers you in a gift that seems extravagant, what's the best option? What's the best action now? Think Mblex, okay? What is the best answer? So if a client offers you a gift that seems extravagant, what do you do? A, thank them sincerely. B, thank them sincerely and stop seeing them as a client. C, thank them sincerely and mention that it's, oh, this is too much, but their generosity is appreciated. D, thank them sincerely and politely refuse the gift. What do you think the best answer is? Now, this may not be what you do in practice, but it's what you're gonna answer on the emblex. Thank them sincerely and politely refuse the gift. It changes the therapeutic relationship if they give you a big gift. If they buy you a car, that's a problem. It's changing the therapeutic relationship. Do you need a car? Yes. So maybe you thank them sincerely, but you see how that can get muddy, mucky? Best answer, politely refuse. Boundary crossings are different than boundary violations. What is an example of a boundary crossing? Texting from a personal phone, asking a client their birth date, confirming an appointment 24 hours in advance. Mm -hmm. Yay, you guys all got that right. Yay, good. Okay, let's go back and let me make sure this was. Yes, you all got that right. Good job. Yay, good, I'm so glad. All right, boundary crossing, what is an example? Texting from a personal phone, asking a client their birth date, confirming an appointment 24 hours in advance. Best answer? You guys are on point today. Boom, texting from a personal phone. It's a boundary crossing. Yeah, I mean, we got just gotta be careful. Boundary crossings are different than violations. What's a boundary violation? A, 
accepting a gift card with a value of $25 that they're not going to use and they're giving it to you as a tip. B, having dinner with your client. C, treating the client's 21-year-old daughter. D, responding when a client says hello to you at the gym. What is an example of a boundary violation? Ooh, getting some, getting some. All right. What is, it's a violation, right? I see the answers coming in. Oh, you guys are on point. Good. Yes, having dinner with a client. Having dinner with a client. I'm sorry, you guys. I know it seems normal, natural. I mean, I see clients at their home and they say, stay for dinner. And I'm like, oh, I can't. I know. But it changes the therapeutic relationship. We're done. <laughs> Woo, thank you very much for hanging in there. Yeah, let me sign off on the recording because it's probably going to go long. Uh, I want to say thanks so much for hanging in there. Uh, my name again is Jody Skulls. I am your instructor for the MBLEX review course. Good job today. This is a sticky, long, thick, arduous, difficult subject, subject and you hung in there like champs. Um, and I look forward to seeing you again soon in another MBLEX review course.